We'll go on to Melinda tankard Reist. So Melinda tankard Reist is a journalist. She has written over four books, maybe seven books, um, mostly published by Spin Effect Press. The book is called He Chose Porn Over Me, and it's women's experience of pornography. Can you tell us a bit about yourself and mm -hmm. what you've been doing, what other books you've written, etc.? cetera? Sure. Thanks for having me, Joe. It really is a privilege to uh, be on this wonderful program. So I'm a, an Australian writer and I'm a speaker and a campaigner. I've had six of my seven books published by Spinifex Press, which I'm sure is a publisher you've heard of. And I also am co-founder of the grassroots campaigning movement Collective Shout for a World Free of Sexploitation. We run campaigns in Australia against advertisers, marketers and corporations who objectify women and sexualize girls to sell products and services. And we run global campaigns as well. In 2021, we had 20 victories. Seven of those were global. Uh, some of those were against multi-billion, multi-trillion dollar corporations. So uh, most days I'm either speaking in a school or I'm running a campaign with Collective Shout. Wow, that's fantastic. And are you getting a lot of interest in your work in, in, in this area, say in schools or uh, universities? What, what Absolutely. Are you the work has taken off. Uh, I've been speaking on issues related to sexualization, objectification, porn harms, porn culture, trafficking and violence against women and the intersection, how all those things intersect uh, for about 15 or more years. I would say that now the difference is that the language we used back then, like sexualization of children, wasn't that well established. But now those words are in the public lexicon. They're, you know, front page of our newspapers. Pornography, for example, when I first started speaking and writing on that issue in Australia uh, around a decade ago, uh, it wasn't really accepted that porn was harmful and particularly harmful to young people. Uh, I was accused of exaggerating, creating a moral panic, you know, all that kind of language. And now, again, in the mainstream, it, it is accepted that porn is, is distorting and twisting and uh, young people's sexual templates, it's giving them harmful ideas about bodies, relationships and sexuality. There's, a co of course, now a, a global body of literature testifying to the harms. So uh, my work is, fortunately... <laughs> in demand, um, booked out in, in schools and other communities for and into next year now, and yeah. speaking on porn, porn harms, violence against girls, and, and how young women especially can enforce boundaries and say no and stand up for themselves, um, calling out the daily sexual intrusions, the daily sexual harassment, the rape jokes, the sexual groaning and moaning, the demands for naked pictures. Uh, we try to empower them to recognise that they shouldn't have to put up with any of that. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. And it's um, it seems as if schools are an interesting place because they have a duty of safeguarding, of looking after and developing exactly. children and and girls where um, they can't ignore what's happening um, sometimes within schools. If it's a mixed school or the moment they leave the school gates or go to parties, that this is getting much, much worse. And I think um, in Britain, we've had a everyone's invited movement where young women during lockdown got together and saw how or, or talked to each other and said, oh, this is happening to all of us or almost mm -hmm. all of us. And they demanded that there was some the grown ups in the room, which in many cases are schools. So I think that's happening, too, that we're getting in schools. A lot of uh, the organizations of schools are, are trying to get people like you in. When I speak to schools, I remind them of the, that duty of care that you've mentioned. They have a legal obligation to provide a safe educational environment. If girls are being sexually harassed, groaned at, moaned at, demanded to send pictures, threatened with rape and violence, if girls are forced to see boys masturbating on the school bus, which is happening here, wow. uh, looking, consuming porn in the classroom, in the schoolyard, at the school camp, uh, then schools have failed in that duty of care. And in addition, I have more female teachers telling me that they are leaving the profession because they're being propositioned every day. They have boys taking photos up their skirts. Uh, mm -hmm. They don't feel safe in the school. They're being sexually groaned and moaned at as well, which is a huge phenomenon here, and it's probably happening there as well. 
so you're right, they have a legal obligation to their students and also to create a safe workplace. And I say directly to schools, you know, if you don't address this, your school is actually a crime scene. Like that's how serious this ish issue yeah. is. Yeah. And you're also breeding a generation of sociopaths because if these boys are allowed to behave like this now, as young as 10, 11, 12, and they're never called out on it, what happens when they enter the police force? Or they're a judge sitting on a, a bench making a ruling in a rape case or a sexual harassment case. So it's not serving the boys either not to call them out and have some consequences for behaviour. Yeah. And what about um, your work? Uh, this sounds quite similar to Gail Dine's culture mm -hmm. reframed. Um, and, you know, she's written Pornland and a range of different things. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you link up with Gail Dine's at all? Absolutely. Uh, Gail endorsed my latest book and she also has chapters in two or three of my other books. Uh, Gail wrote a wonderful endorsement for the new book. He chose Porn Over Me and in fact said she couldn't she couldn't put it down. So it was wonderful to have a Gail's endorsements. But yeah, we value our global partners. Uh, you know, we need we need to work together if we're going to rein in this predatory global multi-billion dollar industry which is causing so much devastation and, and destruction yeah that's great so um could you tell us about the book and uh mm. sort of uh, introduce to women why they why they would want to buy it um yeah sure well something i've tried to do as a writer over many years is to document the lived experiences of women the personal narratives of of women and particularly stories that haven't been told, haven't had the attention they, they warrant. And it seemed to me the time had come for a collection of stories uh, from women on the lived experience of it being in a relationship with a habitual porn consuming male who won't change, doesn't want to change. And it really came about when at the end of last year, I shared a post about a young woman in her early 20s who just called off her wedding the same week she discovered that her fiance was a compulsive porn user and women started responding and saying well i wish i'd called off my wedding i wish i'd heard the advice don't date men who use porn i wish i'd seen the warning signs i wish i'd seen the red flags and i thought i think there's a book i think there's a collection here because the stories just kept coming so i i started contacting the women who had were commenting all over my social media pages and invited them to contribute and and 25 did well i had more than 25 but i, I published 25 because i wanted to really show an inside view of well, well what it is what is what is it like what it is it like that the man would prefer porn to her or you know demand um vile degrading depersonalizing dehumanizing sex acts or a demand that she consume porn with him or demand that she be filmed to make their own homemade porn what what does that feel like you know what is it like to sort of sacrifice yourself uh, to a habitual porn user and should you have to do that for some women they were just completely ignored by their partner because she couldn't compete with what he found online so she ends up abandoned you know neglected and yeah, they're the stories I wanted to tell. One as a warning to younger women, don't date men who use porn. And secondly, a sort of as a permission giving collection saying, you know, you shouldn't have to endure this because some of these women were waiting 20, 30 years for him to change. They felt they couldn't, you know, break the marriage. They had to support him. They had to be there for him. It would be wrong of them. And of course, they've got an entire therapeutic industry telling them that it's her fault, not his. She's hung up about sex. This is what all men do and she should service him at his every demand. And so it was really to say to those women, look, you don't have to live a half life. You, you shouldn't have to um, completely sacrifice yourself for this man who really does not care for you. Uh, you shouldn't have to put up with uh, his entitlement, uh, his really young women have been groomed to accept sexual assault uh, by men who don't value their full humanity. And uh, so really it was, you know, to help those women to see that they should be allowed to to exit and not put up with the emotional and psychological abuse, which so many have. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. So there are stories from women in the last few years so that and there that and then also some explanation or, or analysis of how you don't have to put up with it. Um, that's great. So um, are, are you able to read us a bit of the book or, to, or... I certainly can. Yeah. 
I'll, uh, I'll read from my speech that I gave at the, the global launch, which is basically taken from the introduction to the book. So we have the introduction, which is an analysis, and then we have 25 stories. And then we also have a resource section to help women to know where, where to get help. So the 25 women in, in this book were collateral damage in their partner's insatiable greed for porn. Their stories tell of the crushing of intimacy, respect, connection, and love. The women felt inadequate, devalued, not able to compete, never good enough. Porn colonized their union, their families and homes, seeped into every aspect of their lives, leaving women rejected and scarred. Porn consumption changed the way their partner acted towards them. Quote, he used me like a blow up doll, writes Florence. Women told of a total lack of respect for their boundaries, an overblown sense of entitlement, expectations that they would provide sex on demand and participate in sex acts they found degrading and demeaning. The man's gratification triumphed empathy every time. Women described having to replicate the performance of women in the porn industry with their partners expecting a porn star experience. The women could tell when their partners were using porn or having a relapse because the nature of the sex changed. Quote, it was amazing how his behavior changed when he was watching porn compared to when he was not watching it, writes Maggie. I knew when he had had a lapse before he even told me. It is difficult to refuse sex when in a relationship with a man engulfed in porn. In porn, when our women are up to it 24 seven and refusal is just another porn genre called forced or violated. Forcing compliance was a standard component of the men's sexual repertoire. Madeline told me he would emotionally abuse me for saying no. And Kate wrote in the book, after being forced to perform sexual tasks for his own pleasure, I would lie in bed and cry silently. Men asserted their sexual ownership over their partners. Women were subjected to what was essentially sexual terrorism in their own homes. The men turbocharged by porn were intoxicated by sexualized power. Some women made the stomach churning discovery of child sexual exploitation material on their partner's computer. He chose porn over me situates porn as a significant element in the perpetration of domestic abuse. The men in this book carried out physical, mental, financial, verbal, emotional, and spiritual violence. The porn that the men were consuming translated into sexual and emotional abuse and coercive control of their partners. Some women described near death experiences from porn inspired sex acts, in particular choking, a red flag for homicide. A number of women were raped by their partners. One passed out after being strangled during sex. Another described being unable to breathe when her partner put his full weight on her and pressed her face into the pillow. Two women were pressured into sex shortly after the birth of a child, with one suffering the agony of torn stitches as a result. He chose porn over me is intended as a warning to young women, don't date men who use porn. Why choose to walk into hell? In the words of Sarah McDougall, who's contributed a chapter in this book. The book is also for women drowning in self blame. The women who think there is something wrong with them for feeling repulsed when men want to act out their violent fantasies on their bodies. And for the women who know deep down it's not meant to be like this. It's also a permission giving book. Women should not have to sacrifice their lives for a man who shows no desire to choose her over porn, who has allowed the erosion of his humanity and become a patron of a global industry built on the bodies of women and girls. You should not be expected to sacrifice the rest of your life to a porn twisted man who loves his porn more than he loves you. The women who tell their distressing stories are now rebuilding and reclaiming their lives. And they want their experiences to be of help to other women. They have generously offered their advice in the hope that lessons can be learned, that relationships with men hooked up to pornography's misogyny drip system will not lead to happiness and flourishing I hope this book will help women demand higher standards in relationships, be more discerning, recognize the signs, 
and turn away from men who consume porn and that more broadly individuals who value intimacy connection mutuality empathy and compassion to quote robert jensen as i do in the end of the book quote the emotions that make stable decent human communities possible will endeavor to protect these essential qualities from de being devoured by the global porn industry. So uh, I recommend the book, commend the book to you, and you can get that from a SpinFX Press. Going to be launching the book at Philia. Um, it's such a wonderful opportunity. I'm so grateful for to speak at the biggest feminist conference in, in Europe. And my colleague, Caitlin Roper, will also be launching her book, uh, which I may as well show you. Sex Dolls, Robots and Women Hating, A Case for Resistance. So two spin effects books that have just come out, one after the other, and uh, we will have the privilege of launching our new titles at that at that conference. As you were reading, I had a couple of sort of questions or points I wanted to make. That, um, one of the um, things that you seem to be sort of saying is that the driver of male behaviour um, these women are experiencing and you know because of porn culture this total mm -hmm. we're living in a complete porn culture that the the sexual driver of getting women to behave as porn porn stars um seems to be sort of central to a lot of how they behave if mm -hmm. if they're consuming it if they're hooked into it um and because so many men are um how far do you think that this sexual motive this this drive to use women sexually as objects porn objects is central to women's subordination to this patriarchy are oh, so significant i'm i'm seeing it enacted every day the stories that i'm hearing are are getting worse so what porn, the porn industry does is it takes an already pre-existing sense of entitlement that boys are taught from a very young age and it, and it puts that entitlement on steroids. So girls tell us stories like, he went for my throat without even asking, or he wanted to, to hit me, gag me, tie me up, you know, bind me, act out sadomasochistic acts on me. And this is not just happening in porn, which is the biggest Department of Education in the world, the, the kids are seeing this stuff on TikTok. You know, there's ent an entire genre called King Talk, hashtag King Talk, which depicts young women fantasizing about being gagged and choked, which shows images of women covered in bruises with the tagline, well, that one was actually on Instagram, if, if she doesn't look like sex after this, you didn't do it right. So they're learning a very degraded, depersonalized, dehumanized version of human sexuality. Uh, what hope is there for forming long term intimate partnerships and connections uh, when porn basically says women are meat and you can do whatever you want to them? So increasingly younger girls are describing violent, sexually aggressive acts that increasingly younger boys want to carry out on them. We've seen a rise of child on child sexual assault in schools at rates never before seen. And that's because of this experiment on the sexual development of our young people. So I think it's playing a massive role because girls tell me they think there's something wrong, wrong with them if they don't want to be subjected to bondage and, and so-called kink practices. They think they must be hung up and prudish rather than, as we try to help them to do, critiquing the culture that makes them feel, feel that way because it serves men and it serves the sex industry for young women to think, oh, well, this is empowering, this is liberating, this is sex positive, because, you know, God forbid you wouldn't want to look sex positive. But what does that yeah. really mean? But, I mean, you know? I, th I think that, that definitely it's fantastic to talk to young women and to give this mm. message and, and, and the book sounds amazing and it's good for mm. any women to mm. sort of have this message, don't date men who use yeah. porn, but um, a sort of feminist, uh, you know, I often see this on, on social media is yeah. just don't date men. And it, it, it's true. It's true. You could don't date men. I mean, I, I and and then I'm just going to sort of say that this other thing I was thinking when you were talking is yeah. this old time joke saying, what's the difference between a radical feminist and a lesbian? And yeah. it's three months. And what they're saying is that in the in the joke is that when you start to see mm. what's going on, which your book's showing, 
That's you right. sort of go through this process of thinking, okay, don't date men who don't date men who use porn. And then you think, oh, well, they all use porn or they lie about it. And so if you have been in a relationship with a man, then mm. often the there is, there are no men who don't use porn. And so you, so an option that you know that political lesbianism would say is mm. you can choose in the circumstances or choose a sensible thing to reconstruct or sort of have a sexuality uh, or to open your sexuality to the lesbian part of it but well, that's what mm. many of us would say but what what do you think i mean how can you find men how can young women find males who don't use porn i mean presumably all the boys are going to lie yeah it's getting increasingly impossible given given what we know about rates of exposure and how young the exposure is uh, I don't know that it is po that it will be possible. To be honest, uh, I have girls telling me actually they've decided, even though they don't uh, consider themselves a lesbian, but they have decided to not have anything to do uh, with young men because what's on offer is so disgusting to them uh, that they're actually telling me that they've chosen to be voluntarily celibate uh, because. They don't want anything to do with these with these boys. It's it's disgusting. So, you know, you, what you're onto something there for sure. I mean, I think I think it's. I mean, it's terribly sad um, mm. that that young women might find. Uh, I mean, given also all the culture we're in, which is sort of promoting the the sort of young romantic sexuality, heterosexual sexuality it's terribly sad that that women are being young women are being encouraged mm -hmm. to believe mm -hmm. that would be a reasonable man and also discouraged from being lesbians and there the not being many role models and then mm -hmm. then it's impossible to actually have a relationship with a man so i sort of think one option is definitely the promotion of lesbianism as an option sort of making that available mm -hmm. um and then then that's because that you know oh undoing the taboo around lesbianism it, it could be a uh, really important and what about the women in your book what are they mm. saying well, did they go on did they think that they could find men who some of them some of them did yeah yeah some of them did some are happily single with raising children um there's a, there's a real mixture some of them tragically are still in those relationships and they're, they're the ones that kind of break my heart the most because they're still holding out for that moment when he might change and they don't feel they can leave. And of course, it's hard to leave. Often he controls the finances. Often they've stayed home raising children and don't have independent sources of income. Uh, often he's the house is in his name or he's set up offshore tax havens and doesn't have to pay child support when she leaves. Uh, one woman in my book described how he'd got a mistress and was buying her lots of expensive things and gifts but was also suing her for child support for the times when he had the children and she had no source of income and he'd hidden you know all of these assets and funds uh so you know even though i, I think you know there's definitely a case for women to get out it's it's very hard practically you know to get out uh so yeah there's a real mix some have stayed some have left some have repartnered some have uh, stayed happily happily single and certainly aren't looking uh, to be in a relationship uh, one woman in my book left her first husband because of his porn consumption gets into a new relationship marries the new guy she begs him tell me the truth tell me the truth if you are a porn consumer you must tell me because I've been through this before and I couldn't go through it again he lies to her and she ends up in the same situation twice in a row I, I was okay. thinking couldn't I mean I, I I think we should have like prenuptial things where, which say uh, the man would have to sign it if you if people do women do get together with the man he would sign it mm -hmm. saying I don't use porn I disagree mm -hmm. with all the practices I I'm not going to use porn and if I do use it I'm going to mm -hmm. give you all my money Everything. or something like that. <laughs> I, I, I this will be grounds for divorce absolutely yeah. and lying and but possibly yeah. you know like it's deception isn't it so it's maybe a form it of is. race to say this absolutely. is deception. because so many of them lie but uh, has anybody Correct. completed that prenup thing because that would be quite useful. no no you you could start a whole new trend uh with with that idea joe no one has uh, i haven't i haven't heard of anyone suggesting that perhaps it's not such a big thing here in australia perhaps it would take off more in the us they absolutely have a right to know because they're not making an informed decision if it's kept from them and certainly that's the case with with a lot of women it's kept from them yeah 
so that's a real issue. Now, another question I have about mm. about it is at the structural level. So mm. in terms of policy, um, you know, porn being available, etc. Mm -hmm. That's part of the picture because mm -hmm. uh, women's you know us talking to each other warning young women is mm. part of it and and you know what we can do about it as individuals or little groups of women but what about mm. at the structural level what's going on there and what what mm. are your recommendations well you know we're taking an incremental approach because i've worked in politics and we won't get everything we want straight away you know naturally we want to bring the industry down and we're part of the global campaign against Pornhub, which has finally seen this massive misogynist biggest dispenser of women hating platform in the world brought to account for trafficking, non-consensual image sharing, rape videos, uh, underage girls content. Uh, so we'll keep up that pressure to certainly bring this industry to account. Uh, what we're trying to do here in Australia and uh, I, I believe this campaign is, is, uh, has been relaunched in the UK and other countries is uh, proof of age protections for children. Uh, we would like to think there's still common ground, some common ground around protecting children from rape porn, torture porn, sadism, incest, you know, bestiality. Can't we agree that little kids shouldn't be seeing this at the click of a button? And they are seeing this because the most popular genres of porn are the most violent. Uh, so we've been trying to get up a proof of age protection system in Australia. The eSafety Commission here was tasked by the previous federal government to come up with a roadmap to roll out a system. The, the eSafety Commission is to report by the end of this year. And we'll see what they recommend. Uh, but surely this is one basic thing we could do to at least uh, protect children from, you know, being exposed to torture and sadism and extreme suffering of, of women. Are there any countries that have banned porn? Not banned it, I don't believe. Mm. Yeah, I mean, if they're online, like how do you ban it unless you ban the internet? Uh, yeah, I, I don't think so. So that's yeah. maybe North Korea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I read that Nepal had banned it a while. Oh ago. yes, Nepal. That's right. You're right, actually. Um, but because they, 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 because it was, they were losing so many children, um, mm. and in our, it was just devastating that uh, they they thought about it. And um, but I don't, I don't know if it's still banned there. But that was quite encouraging mm. that mm. a society could see it as causing like the generator of problems. Absolutely, and if only that was uh, replicated in other countries, because uh, the, the the harm that this industry is doing uh, to to everyone to to decent human society to civilization <laughs> you know as robert jensen said porn is what the end of the world looks like and i really do fear where this is is taking us as a society because we're knocking the empathy out of boys especially so we're, we're seeing more degraded and debased brutal callous behavior in younger boys yeah uh, and Andrew Tate, you know, a phenomenon like Andrew Tate is ramping that up and and making it popular to to be anti women, to be misogynist, to put women in their place. And we would go to schools where boys cheer when Andrew Tate's name is mentioned. They they'll cheer and and clap. And so again, where where are the the healthy role models for for young men? Yeah, and I mean, I found that uh, you know, if you meet men and talk to them. Uh, they'll be very happy to talk about politics, uh, you know, things that they support. And then I'll say, yeah, but we can't solve it without solving porn. And they go, they say things like, oh, you're getting, um, you're getting, putting the chicken before the egg, or you're confused about that because that's private. And we yeah. can, I think we can separate those out. And it's, yeah. it's, the, it's the internet's fault. It's not patriarchy. It's not. And you can yeah. just see them defending that, you know, you, you know, straight away what yeah. they, they love porn and they want well, their... Don't get in the way of a man and his, and his right to ejaculate to whatever he wants, basically. So, yeah. 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 So, um, uh, thank you so much. I just, uh, before we come to an end, we, um, 
is there anything else you would like to add about the book or well, there's a phrase i'd like to use because it was used in um a panel discussion i was filmed for a few days ago and i I, I really like this phrase. I think what it's true is the societal societal gaslighting of women who describe what it is uh, like to have a sexual relationship um, with a man who consumes porn, and they they get gaslit by by society, by pro porn culture, by therapists who blame them and say, "Well, you're prudish and you're hung up," or men do this often by their friends and family that join in the gaslighting, and you know, that 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 has to stop and I hope this book will help to contribute to uh, helping women to be to be strong to enforce their boundaries to demand better for themselves uh, rather than allowing their lives to be degraded and often devalued and destroyed by habitual porn consuming uh, men who have become patrons of this this global industry and allowed the erosion of their humanity so uh, you know stop the gaslighting at every, every level and hopefully women will recognize that they should not have to put up with this and and demand better